a little bit in the five o'clock hour. Joined by a good friend of the show, Adam Rittenberg, ESPN, with Paul, and I'm again David Smoke on 365 Sports. Adam, what do you think are the more intriguing storylines in in uh, in the spring? The new coaches with like Dion Fickle rule. Or the quarterback transfers. I saw you did a story on DJU, Slovis, Hartman. Uh, which of those two is more intriguing? Yeah, it's always tough. Those are those are always the, the two groups you look at. You know, in the off season, I think it's probably the new coaches this year. I, I don't think the quarterback transfer class this year matches last year's as far as big names and intrigue. Although Sam Hartman is a heck of a player. I had a chance to visit with him last week. And, you know, he's at Notre Dame now. And, uh, you know, he's really going to have to learn a completely new system. You know, much like DJ Wangalale, who I talked to yesterday at Oregon State, you know, this is these are very, very different offenses for, for those two. Now, in Hartman's case, he was leaving a, a situation where he was the starter, whereas DJ obviously had, had lost that job. But I, I think it's probably the, 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 the new coaches. When you think about Deion Sanders, at Colorado, Luke Fickle at uh, at Wisconsin, Matt Rule at Nebraska. It was a, a kind of more interesting year in the coaching cycle than I thought going in. Um, and, uh, yeah, all those new coaches are going to be fun to watch this season. Who do you think hits the ground running the best out of the new group? Well, I, I think the thing to remember at Wisconsin is that it wasn't as though that program was broken. That program has won – you know, I, I don't know the average, but it's got to be over eight games a year, so at least the high seven games a year in the last 30 years. So it's not like Wisconsin has been a down program, but they feel like they can take another step, especially with the 12-team playoff on the horizon. It was very interesting, guys. I was up there last Thursday, a week from a week ago today, and watching the air raid at the University of Wisconsin is a sight to be seen because it just isn't what you associate with that, with that offense and that, and that place. I mean, they're snapping the ball with, uh, with 25 seconds left on the play clock. Tanner Mordecai, a guy who, who played football there in the state of Texas last, the last couple of years at SMU, he's going to be the quarterback. And so it'll be very interesting to see, but I think that's a program again. You know, those, those athletes are used to winning. I think they've accepted Luke Fickle and his coaching staff. Luke, Luke is a heck of a coach. And I think they have an opportunity in what likely will be the final year of division in the Big Ten to win the Big Ten West, especially if they do take a jump offensively because they haven't been very good on that side of the ball lately. What about what Dion has created? We had Brian Howell who covers them for the Boulder Daily Camera. Just what the the energy – uh, all of what he's created at Colorado, has it even been more? We don't know about wins and losses, but has it been even more than you expected? Absolutely. I, I can't remember an offseason quite like this for a team that was so poor last year. And you know, I was there a couple of months ago to do a story on Dion, and you know, that was what was said. Is that there's only one person that could have created this type of energy. I mean, obviously, Nick Saban probably could have, but you know, only one realistic candidate they could have hired after the 1-11 season to, to generate this interest and excitement and buzz throughout the offseason. And they really felt that, you know, by going 1-11, what do we have to lose by hiring Deion Sanders? Certainly he's a, 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 a not your typical hire. There's a, a bit of risk there um, you know, for a guy that wasn't, isn't a career college coach and hasn't been in the Power Five. But he's already uh, you know, shown you the positives in terms of interest, in terms of recruiting, you know, just just the, uh, the the way that we're talking about Colorado football, you said, the, the, ever since December, they've been a huge talking point in the sport. So I, I, I'm with you. I don't know about wins and losses. Some of the coaches I was out west here this week visiting with were asking me about them, and I, I still think they have a ways to go at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the offensive and defensive line, but I think the product will be a lot more fun to watch this year with Deion Sanders on the sideline. Adam, do you think that his recruiting will pick up maybe a little bit more when USC and UCLA leave the conference so that um, he is the kind of, you know, he and the rest of the Pac-12 can try to go and own as much of L.A. as they can in spite of those two schools leaving, but can be one of the L.A. destination schools for people who still want to play in the Pac-12? Well, I think it's going to be interesting. You know, Dion's staff right now is not very L.A. centric. It's something that you, if you follow their recruiting since they arrived, it's been players from other regions, from Florida, which is Dion Sanders' home state, Texas, where he where he lives and, and spent much of his career. They have not hit California 
like they could in the future. But I also don't know if this staff is, is, is really tied to that state. And we all know the great Colorado teams in the, in the 80s and early 90s with Bill McCartney and then carrying over to Rick Neuheisel. Those teams were uh, largely California-based, um, you know, especially in the L.A. area. I, I still think that USC and UCLA are going to do well, especially USC, with their, with their homegrown recruits. But it'll be interesting to see if Colorado pivots a little bit more because that stood out to me and to other coaches that even though they're doing really well in the portal and the recruiting has gone up, it hasn't been with California players as much as players from other, other states and other regions. The clock rules today were passed. Division three said, no, we'll, we'll push this back. But your thoughts about the clock not stopping in a stopping. And you've covered many of those four hour games. And as you know, Adam, we covered Baylor with Art Browse in that offense where they might have 40 first downs and score a lot. It was sometimes four plus hours fun to watch, I guess, for the fans. But your thoughts about the rules changes. Yeah, I think it was inevitable that this was going to happen, even though it's obviously been a staple in college football, um, you know, to, to, to make the game speed up a little bit, to reduce the, the injury in terms of the number of plays. Um, you know, it, it, it certainly takes a little bit of what we know about college football away. I know people bring up the media timeouts, and that's why the games are longer. Well, those aren't going to go away. I mean, the media timeouts are the reasons why these coaches get paid that much money and why there is so much money around these programs. So that's not going to change. This is one way to shorten games a little bit. I'm a big baseball fan. I think you guys are as well. Love the pitch clock change. I think sporting events in general should not be longer than three hours and 15 minutes. Three hours and 30 minutes is really pushing it. And as you noted, a lot of college football games were exceeding that that number, that, that amount of time. So uh, you know, I don't want to see college football become a, a two-and-a-half-hour sport, uh, You know, even a two-hour and 40-minute sport. I think it should be right around three hours, 3.15. Anything beyond that is really asking a lot of the players and obviously everybody else associated with the game. Yeah, I think like the only the only negative to the pitch clock in, in baseball is that if you're at the game – uh, and you want a beer, you better act efficiently because it is it is moving a lot faster than it <laughs> used to. Uh, but I wonder if Bill's beer sales are down because uh, of it. Well, they're like some of them moving the goalposts on you know what inning they're they're shutting it down now too. But Adam, it, it is one of those things though that you know as the offenses have, I don't think people are going to notice the clock not stopping after first downs as much as they think they are. No, I, you know, I think it'll be interesting to just look back at games and, 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 and stat sheets and how many possessions uh, each team has because you're probably going to lose, you know, I would say two to three possessions on each side depending on the, the tempo that you're going at. Um, uh, you know, air raid, two air raid teams are still going to have a lot of plays. You know, two teams that are more pro style and don't care as much about tempo, um, there's not going to be as many possessions for them. So, But, but I don't think the average fan is going to notice a, a whole lot of, uh, of difference. It will be interesting to see, guys, if, if we don't see as many of those furious comebacks that, um, that we love in college football but also have been, I, I think, influenced by the clock stoppage after the first down because sometimes you won't have enough time if you're down three, four scores to erase that type of deficit because of the running clock. Adam Rittenberg with us on 365 Sports. Adam, as you know, the Big 12 with 14 teams, the four incoming teams, Texas and Oklahoma with another year left. I honestly have no idea, and really for the first time in maybe a while, Texas truly has what appear to be legitimacy to the expectations. We have no idea about Brent Venable's year two. Baylor's trying to bounce back from disappointment. Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Tech got hot at the end. You have any idea what to expect? Yeah, to me, guys, it's as simple as this. If Texas can't win the Big 12 this year, you have to wonder when the next conference title will be coming to Austin because we know that they're entering a tougher conference. It, it's going to be most likely worse before it gets better. And I, I really believe, and at least their famous last words, that they have the best roster in the Big 12 and possibly by a wide margin. Now, they, did that. they had that last year. You could talk to Big 12 coaches about how talented Texas was and for whatever reason they couldn't translate that into um, even an appearance in the Big 12 championship game. So you can't count out uh, those other teams, Oklahoma, Baylor, Kansas State that won the league last year, um, uh, TCU. Uh, you, know, you, you, you can't dismiss them, but when I look at just who's coming back and the talent level, it should be Texas and everybody else. I just don't know if they can translate that. I don't know if Steve Sarkeesian as talented and gifted as a play caller as he is 
can he win a conference title as a head coach? That that certainly has eluded him so far. You know, I um, I think the the key for Texas because the the difference was last year. Uh, they they did catch a little bit of the Tom Hermans and forgot Bijan was there in a couple games, especially late when they had leads. But can Quinn Ewers throw them to victories? When it was when it was that issue last year, that's when they did lose games. So has he taken that step forward to be able to pass them to a win? Which in year one he wasn't completely able to, but what was to be expected? It was his first year as a starting quarterback. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I think there'll be more on Quinn's shoulders, but I think the other thing, too, is that the defense took the right steps last year. That was a much improved Texas defense, and I like a lot of the pieces that they have coming back, some of the you know, transfers that they've added. Um, and, and it's now you know, year three with, with Pete Kwiatkowski and then Gary Patterson, as we know, also helping that defense. So it's not all on Quinn Ewers, but to your point, there's going to be games where he's going to have to be the reason why they win. Instead of you know, sometimes the last year, the, the reason why they came up a little bit short. So, um, you know, this is his third year now at the college level. I know the, the first year was a weird one at Ohio State, but I, I think he'll be more comfortable in that offense. It certainly seemed like this spring that there was no no debate about, uh, you know, would, would Arch Manning really make a push for that? Quinn, Quinn looked like the starter, and now he's got to play like one in a, in a second year starter. I think for Texas to win the Big 12. Adam, as always, thanks for you. Uh, again, great Twitter follow. Also, the articles, columns, Adam Rittenberg from ESPN. Thank you, sir, for your time. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Have a great show. Have a great weekend, too. Adam Rittenberg, ESPN.com. Uh, there's some other.